Hi guys, it's Steph from iDriver Classic and in today's video we're taking a look at the fantastic Ford Escort and this is quite a cool one because this is a Ford Escort Mark III and not only that, it's an auto which I think in the UK we've got less than 10 left on the road according to that dubious website hamleyleft.com Anyway, in today's video we're going to take a look around the outside so we're going to show you all the fantastic bits and pieces on the outside of the car a few original stickers then we'll bring you inside to have a look at the dash before we do a more detailed walkthrough together and of course there's always a look under the bonnet so you can see what's running as we're driving along and then of course to finish it off we're going to take the car up for a drive where I can tell you if this car really is the fantastic car that everybody says it is because you always hear lots of lovely things about escorts so let's take it out and uh, give it a ride and see what she's made of. Now this car is absolutely amazing and I cannot wait to show you guys but first of all I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Ford Escort history because there's an awful lot to go through. So in revisiting that history let's go all the way back to September 1980 when this car launched. Now the Ford Escort name had been in use since 1968 and it was when Ford looked at the range and they thought right we need to add a small family car in We've got a competition coming up, so they looked at what BL were doing, especially because they were trying to crack the British market as well, because at the time they didn't have that market share, and they did really well with it. In fact, throughout the 60s and 70s, there were points where the Ford Escort was the best seller. So by the Mark III, the third generation as we see here today, the name was really well established and really highly thought of, because they'd beaten off other marks and models, and just people thought the Ford Escort was fantastic. Now... Despite the Ford Escort name being so well thought of, Ford did temporarily toy with the idea of calling the car Erica, so it would be in the Ford Erica. However, when we go for a drive, I'll tell you a little bit about why they didn't go with that. It was dropped for a few reasons, and besides, why are you gonna drop the name Escort? It's great, people know what it is, people know what to expect. People love the Escort. Don't mess with something that's good. Now part of the reason for the name change wasn't because Ford just felt a bit frisky, it was because the car was a massive step on from the Mark II. So whereas the Mark II had been a refresh of the Mark I, the third generation Escort offered by something totally different. So the new car was seen as a bit of a high tech rival to the Golf and the Civic and not only boasted new technology but it was a front wheel drive car too and that was kind of something that the market was moving away from. So through the 70s and into the 80s, people were doing away with rear wheel drive and they were moving into that front wheel drive world. And it was Ford's second front wheel drive within Europe. The Fiesta that we took out last week was the first one. And it was also a hatchback too. And it was, it sounds bizarre now, but at the time a hatchback was a really big thing. And as we discussed in the British Leyland Autumn Rally, not every manufacturer recognised this and it was much to their detriment because it was really what people wanted along with hot hatches. So it wasn't just the tech under the bonnet to consider, it was the suspension too. So in the Mark II we'd seen the leaf springs but by the Mark III we were onto a new system of coil sprung independent rear with McPherson struts used at the front of the car. And Ford kind of, but they were a lot more receptive I think and understood their market a lot more than some of the other manufacturers of the time because they knew that some of the older buyers those that were set in their ways were going to think wow this is so hugely different from what we're used to which is why they went out with a simplicity message so all their marketing at the time just talked about simplicity they didn't massively oversell everything that they'd put on because they felt that it might scare some of that core Ford Escort market share away, which was a really clever thing to do and quite bold as well because they spent 500 million designing the car alone. How much did they spend on the engine? We'll get to that in a minute. So it was a really bold move to update it as we discussed. And I was gonna say it was a bold move to update the Escort experience, but that just sounds too dodgy for a family video. And it was really well received by the buying public. And in fact, the Ford Escort, the Mark III, as you see here today, was the best seller in the UK between 1982 and 1990. And it was, it overtook the Ford Cortina actually to be the best seller in 1982. Now Ford loved giving the buyer choice. And the Escort was produced as a three door or a five door estate, a hatchback, a two door convertible and a three door van, making it 
quite cleverly a choice for either a family or a tradesman, which makes the bestseller status absolutely no surprise at all, really. And although it's rarely ever mentioned, um, I know that you guys love facts as much as I do. So it's worth mentioning that the Mark III Escort van came to the market a wee bit later than the September 1980 launch, and it arrived in February 1981. And the reason for this was because Ford had slow-moving stock of the Mark II vans, and so they thought, right, we'll hold it back a little bit and try and get people to buy some of those vans. But if you could have seen what you've got in the Mark III opposed to the Mark II, it's no wonder that a lot of people were willing to hold on and wait for this fantastic vehicle. Now under the bonnet, as we'll see in just a minute, you've got to choose many different engine options. You've got everything from your 1.1 to your 1.3 to the 1.6 in this fantastic car we're testing today. Now the 1.3 and 1.6 engines were new to Ford and they were overhead camshaft, which was unlike the 1.1 Valencia, which was something they'd already used and it was available in the Fiesta. So there was a lot going on with this Mark III Escort. In fact, it was a bit of a trailblazer for all the new technology, including that amazing arrow you've just spotted. And um, if you're watching this and you're shouting it and you're saying, Steph, I've got the 1.1 um, CVH engine. Yes, you could have, because in some markets this was introduced before being replaced by the Valencia in 1982. Now, the best selling of all the engine options was the 1.3. And for those of you currently compiling quizzes for your friends whilst we're in lockdown, the investments in these new CVH engines were said to be in the region of £500 million. And really interestingly too, they were built in Wales. However, if you're watching in South Africa, you might be questioning some of the dates and times and choices that I've suggested, because in South Africa, you didn't get as much choice as us. The Escort was only available with the 1.3 and 1.6 engines and was a slightly belated launch to market. And it only arrived in March 1981. And interestingly, part of the reason for difference wasn't because of you know, Ford didn't want to bring it to market. It was simply down to local parts content regulation. Now, I'm not entirely sure how the car fared over there and how it sold, but I can tell you that one of the most popular second-hand, second-hand cars in South Africa is actually the Mark II Golf, which at the time was a competitor in a way to the Escort. Now, going back to the Escort in mainland Europe, buyers got a choice of several transmission preferences. You could have had a choice of your four-speed or five-speed manual and a three-speed automatic, with the automatic variant being the kind we're testing today. And in the UK, the manual transmission options were much more popular. And they make up something crazy, like 99% of the examples you're able to obtain today via Car and Classic, eBay, etc. However, do know if you are telling anybody else about these engine options, the five speed, the transmission options even, the five speed manual was not available until mid 1982. Now we're coming to the end and I cannot wait to show you the inside, but before we go, just to finish off and tell you that the car, the Mark III, came to kind of a bit of an end in 1986 because it was given a facelift and then it was marketed as the Mark IV. Although it was really similar to the Mark III in many ways and my personal preference, I much prefer the look of the Mark III. So the Mark IV was sold until 1992 before being replaced with the Mark V. Now I cannot wait to show you guys this car today. Um, I'm not usually a Ford person, but having borrowed a few lately, they're starting to grow on me. Anyway, if you, like me, are a bit of a BL person or you prefer other manufacturers, stay with me for the video because I think I might be able to change your mind. Now, the first thing I wanted to show you was, weirdly, the thing that caught my eye when I got in the car, this wooden trim on the door. Now, it's a bit of a strange one, because if you think by the 1980s, car styling had moved on massively. We were into the era of moulded plastic, velour seats, and wood feels like a little bit of a throwback to the 70s and the 60s, and I don't know, it just feels a little bit of a strange touch. But as we come round the car, there are plenty of things to like about it. So number one, it feels very sturdy. Everything from these door poles, through to the door handles, through to the window winders, Everything feels like quite a chunky, robust plastic. It doesn't feel like it's about to break, which 
is quite reassuring because as plastic ages it becomes more brittle so it's always quite refreshing to jump in a car of this era and not feel like you're about to break something off with your hand now as we come around the car we look inside the glove box now whilst the lid is quite flimsy it does offer a slight benefit in this weird little cubby hole now whether that's for a first aid kit or just a few little essentials that you might want to keep with you it's a handy thing to have because it stops things rolling around and of course we've got some books as well so we'll have a look at those in just a minute so we'll close the glove box up there now as we come back to the dash in the center you've got a very simple layout because one of these key selling points of the mark III escort and the strap line they went out with was the simplicity was its selling point and it's simple but it doesn't feel too paired back either so in the center here we've got our radio or radio cassette which looking at it seems to be original because you've got your long wave and your medium wave across there you've got your just your standard dials as you would expect and you've also got the cassette down there now as we come down this center console you'll notice we've got the ashtray and what I really like actually is as you pop this open, it is actually a whole compartment because you've got over here, you've got for your ash and your cigarette butts and over here, you've got your cigar lighter. Now, as you push that back in, it just keeps all that really tidy and really streamlined in my opinion. You've not got bits flying out everywhere. You've not got the ash flying out. It's just nicely laid out. And as we come down, we've got a cubby hole here to put bits and pieces in. Now, this is what I really like about this car. It's something else I noticed. And I said to the driver, I said, what, um, what is that? And let me show you, if I can get this right. Now, this is slightly flimsy. These are tape cassette holders, cassette tape holders. I mean, that is something I definitely think I'm gonna end up breaking. But they are, they're very of its time. I mean, there's nothing in them at the moment, but again, Ford had really thought about the space and thought about where you're going to put things because whilst you may not have a parcel shelf you have got other bits of storage down here that you can put your coins in so this is our center console I'll come back and show you the um, the automatic transmission unit in just a second now we're going to slide over and we're going to have a look at what's directly in front of the driver so we've got a three-speed fan around here Again, just controlled on these, so it's very simple and straightforward. Um, over here, we've got the fog lights. So again, just like when we took that Fiesta out in the last episode of iDriver Classic, you can see you've got that little yellow sticker, um, orange sticker even, to tell you that it is on. We've got a blanking plate there and another blanking plate there, which surprises me because um, I'd like to know what they're what you could have got there was the optional extras i know when we took the fiesta out in the last video we said that optional extras were something that ford did really well they sold in really well they really sold that dream of having that top spec car with all the bells and whistles on now we look straight in front of us and it's something that i dearly love about older cars is that simplicity so to our left we've got our rev counter and to the right we've got a speedo with trick clock which is fantastic until you've lived with that trip clock, you don't know how fantastic they are. And then we look into the center of that. So we've got our temperature gauge to the left and we've got our petrol gauge to the right. And around those top and below, we've got a series of warning lights. So we've got um, quite, a few, uh, quite a few extras actually, where we've got things like all warning, you've got your brake, uh, your brake warning light on these, and you get a few extras that weren't available in the earlier cars. Now, if we come to the right of the driver, again, you've just got that demiss button, a couple more blanking plates, and again, just your fan. Now, something that I talked about in the last video, um, that actually I thought was gonna fox me, but didn't get me at all, actually, I found it quite easy to get into once I was driving, is the, it feels like, a, kind of like a, a tree of controls really so over here on our left we've got the uh, so if you pull that so you can just flash someone there you've got your indicators there you've got your horn and you've got over here you've got your light so again it's exactly the same setup as the fiesta so if you watch the fiesta it will probably make a lot of sense to you and then of course over here we've got the wipers so it's down for intermittent which honestly is so handy and then you've got your 
two speed wipers as well and then you've got your washer on the end there too so that's uh that's pretty much it there's a lot of similarities and it doesn't feel like a massive stretch on from that fiesta that we took out in the last episode so yeah we're going to take this out but um before all that let's uh let's have a look at this autom automatic gearbox i want to explain that to you and we'll start the car up so you can hear what she sounds like now with there only being 10 auto well less than 10 auto boxes left on the Mark III Escorts in the UK. Whilst you may see a Mark III Escort and it may not feel too unusual, seeing an auto is certainly a rare treat. So I wanted to show you how the box works. So we start off in park, which you always should do with an auto. Now we go down from park into reverse, neutral, drive, two and then one so as we drive we're going to be sitting in drive which is probably very natural for americans but over here most over here in the uk most people tend to pick a manual so hence why there's probably not so many autos as well now the interesting thing is is with many modern autos or the autos i've certainly driven is you push a little button in and then you change but on this you push down um to change so i've tried to show you that there with a little bit of footage um hopefully that doesn't look too bad at home now we've done that so let's give the car um let's give the car a little rev so you can hear what she sounds like um spoiler i have already driven her she is a really really nice car to drive actually so let's turn that key and crack on now we've had a look around the outside and the inside and we've even had a look at the auto box so it's high time we got this car started up so remember we've got that 1.6 under the bonnet um in being completely transparent with you about everything when we test cars um there is an oil light that keeps coming on on the dash i've been told that that's just a sensor fault it's been checked there's nothing for anybody at home to worry about so let's get this car started up and hear what she sounds like get our dash lights on Sounds pretty healthy. Let's wind down a window. This window winds down a lot easier than the passenger side, but that's probably because you know it's been driven by one person with no passenger. So let's give it a rev. Now let's head out to the back and hear what she sounds like from the exhaust. So I wanted to give you guys a fair indication of what the car sounded like when the car foot down. So at the moment we're going about 20 miles an hour, so we're going to put my foot down so you can hear the auto box in action. And in fact, it's not very noisy at all. We've got a little bit of wind noise from up above us seems to be a bit of um, a bit of air coming in through that um, that's that sunroof but by and large it's a very very quiet car so as we come up you can hear that engine in action now we've got that 1.6 under the bonnet which was the biggest engine you could have got um, and I believe that they only did the auto on the 1.6 and it's got enough poke to keep up with traffic I'm not struggling in any way shape or form it's taking because you can feel it's taking bumps really well and as we come around these corners it's pretty responsive too so we've got the auto box that's very responsive in keeping up with what we're doing and as we approach hills i'm not having to really boot the thing to get it going and as we come around corners i don't feel like we're kind of losing that edge now one of the good one of the criticisms on some of the earlier escorts was that the ride was quite harsh but Again, Ford put a bit of work into that, so I think they took the, um, I think they took the suspension off the Sierra um, and they put it onto this. Now, you can feel as we go through this drive that whilst this road is uh, very unlike a normal I drive a classic test drive, it's very, uh, it's very smooth. In general, it's very quiet, so I'm just going to be quiet there. So if you hear that's about 30 to 40 miles an hour, it's that 
very, very quiet. Now, if you think the typical around town driver wouldn't need to be going much faster than that. And it's nice because it's so quiet in the cab that we can have a really nice conversation as we drive and we can have a chat about how the car's running. And the auto box just takes away some of that thinking that you have to do when you're driving in terms of changing gear and going up and down. Or just Porsche. Or just um, <laughs> takes away some of that thinking that we've got to do and it just keeps us going. So as we come around the corner, you can see that I'm barely having to turn that wheel just to follow the uh, just to follow the, the road itself. It's just all in all, it's just a very nice car to drive, and it's really no wonder that the Ford Escort was so popular. So as I said, in 1990 there were still 1.5 million Mark III Escorts on the road. Um, for many, many years in the 80s, it was a bestseller. Um, all in all, Ford couldn't go wrong with the Escort, which is funny because when the Mark III was in production and when they were designing it, they were going to call it the Ford Erica. Now, people bandy around two different reasons as to why they didn't call it the Erica. Number one is that the Escort name was so strong and it had such a good provenance, um, especially in the UK. And number two was, there was a song called Erica, which was uh, a German marching song during World War II. And so for that reason, they did away from going with Ford Erica, even though it didn't feel like a, you know, it didn't feel like a kind of a small step up from the Mark II to the Mark III, as though we saw in the Mark I to the Mark II. In fact, the Mark III was a very different car to the Mark II, hence why they were banding around that name Erica. Um, but instead they stuck with the trusty name of the Ford Escort and it proved to be, you know, proved to be a great success for the public. It was a nice car to drive, it was easy to run and of course Ford's are cars which keep their value because with a lot of cars that face things like your, um, I'm sorry to say it, being a British Leyland cars in Sierra, quality was a little bit suspect on, you know, people will say, well, you know, you could have got a good Metro or a bad Metro, whereas People saw the Escort as a car which, whether you've got a Monday car, Wednesday or a Friday, you were by and large getting the same sort of quality of car, whereas some of the stuff that British Leyland was producing at the same time was uh, not always of the best quality, but it was a real detriment because in terms of competition, there was a lot on the BL lineup which uh, gave Ford a run for its money. Now I talk about Fords keeping their value, but like many cars of the era, they kind of dipped off a bit. In fact, many people didn't see, you know, the Escort as the coolest car you could have picked. You know, if you wanted a Ford, you might have been hankering after an RS2000. You may not have set your sights on a Mark III Escort. You might have thought, actually, that's just like what dad and granddad have. That's not really what I wanted, or, you know, it's just a company car. But with all, like all Fords nowadays, even things as strange as, you know, your Mark 1 KAs, which are quickly going up in value actually, which uh, to answer the question that many people say to me, what modern car would you buy? Um, Mark 1 KA in great condition, they seem to be going up exponentially, it's crazy. But anyway, coming back to this car, um, whilst maybe 10 years ago, you could have picked something like this up out the back of the local paper for a few hundred quid, in good condition. Nowadays they're going for thousands and thousands of pounds. So if you get the chance to go for something like this, I would say now is the time if you can afford, can afford it to go for, you know, maybe one of the less popular Fords like this Mark III Escort because number one, it looks really cool. Number two, they're holding their value and they're going up in price massively. And number three, because so many of them are made, They've got a massive fan club, so you're able to connect with many like-minded people if you've got a technical question. And number two, because so many were made, just like the Morris Minor actually, um, part supply is plentiful and there's still a market for them and people remember them, which makes, if you do have to sell the car, it makes it sell not easy. Now just like most models of uh, Ford, these have got, a, uh, they have got an owner's club, I'd say a fan club, they have got an owner's club, and there's many people with knowledge that even your local mechanic would be an aura. So if you are buying, looking to buy one of these, make sure you do check out owners clubs because they are a great support and usually they can point you in the direction or steer you away from a car which uh, maybe doesn't deserve the garage space that you've got at home. So I think uh, coming to the end of the video, um, and it has been a very brief driving segment, it's a bit of a bizarre one because 
I've shown you a lot of the outside, the inside, and all the rest of it, and the driving experience has been well. Pretty, I want to say unexceptional, but unexceptional is the wrong word. It's been very different in that there's been nothing wacky which has stood out. It hasn't, you know, it hasn't wowed me with one particular feature. It's just been a very comfortable and pleasurable driving experience. And uh, I guess it's for those young drivers or for people that want the classic car, but the idea of taking on something from the 60s seems very antiquated or just seems very stone age. Why not look at a Mark III Escort? It's lovely to drive, take my word on it. It's very responsive, handling-wise. Certainly much more than some of the other 80s stuff that I've taken out. It's quiet inside the car, and um, you know, you can, you're looking at a car which is not only something you can enjoy, but an investment too. I think the only thing I would advise is making sure that you put a disc lock on, because just like many Fords of the 80s now, these are fast becoming the top 10 cars for would-be thieves, and uh, Budding car, uh, budding car thieves across the UK. So, yes, fantastic car. Really enjoyed taking it out, and I can definitely see why it was the car of the year, and it was the favourite of many driving drivers across the UK, both professionally and personally. And uh, yeah, it's been good fun. So, uh, I hope you've enjoyed the video. Um, the weather's lovely today. I hope it's lovely wherever you are. Um, and until next time, take care and drive safely.